Here we go. Welcome to Hawk Mountain Sanctuary's Stay at Home speaker series. Today's program is The Wind and the Water, Migration Along East Asian Oceanic Flyway with Dr. Camille Concepcion, professor at Mindanao University and former Hawk Mountain Sanctuary conservation trainee. Hi, Camille. Hi, good morning. Well, it's good afternoon to you, but good morning to me. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. And also joining us today is Riley Davenport, Hawk Mountain Sanctuary educator extraordinaire. Hi, Riley. Hi. Thank you for being here. Well, my name is Rachel Taras, and I'm the senior educator at Hawk Mountain Sanctuary, and we are so excited that you are joining us today. Well, Hawk Mountain Sanctuary is the world's very first refuge for birds of prey, and we continue to work hard to be leaders in raptor conservation, science, and education locally and globally across the world. Well, Hawk Mountain Sanctuary is a private, nonprofit, member-supported conservation organization. And membership is the lifeblood of our organization. If you are joining us today, and you are not a member, please consider joining us today. We want you. Well, Hawk Mountain Sanctuary hopes that everyone remains healthy and safe during this time of COVID challenges. We are excited to offer a variety of virtual programming free to our community. As always, Hawk Mountain greatly appreciates and depends on donations. Just so everyone is aware, today's program is being recorded. The video will then be accessible on Hawk Mountain's YouTube channel as a continued resource. We also have a link on our website, hawkmountain.org, directly connecting you to our YouTube channel. At any time during today's program, viewers may submit questions through the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen on the Zoom platform. We've designated time after the presentation to answer some questions from our amazing audience. Well, we're so excited that Dr. Camille Concepcion is joining us today all the way from the Philippines. And before we get started, I'd like to share some of Camille's experience. Well, Camille started studying raptors in 2003, focusing on the Philippine eagle. However, her Hawk Mountain experience in 2011 broadened and deepened her interest in raptor research. For her PhD, she studied movement ecology of the poorly studied Philippine birds of prey. Camille was the very first Speary Fund scholar for raptor conservation science, a scholarship made possible through the work of Hawk Mountain Sanctuary. She is now a professor at Mindanao State University in the Philippines, a Hawk Mountain research associate, and a mother of an intrepid curly-haired toddler. Camille, before we dive in to your presentation, we're curious, what inspired you to study raptors? 
thank you, Rachel, for reading that introduction I wrote. <laughs> um, I did not plan on doing uh, any kind of research. I originally wanted to be a pilot like my father, and I was told I started saying that since I was four years old. And I took steps to apply to the Air Force while I was in college, but they told me I was too short to get in. It was not true. I've healed. It's fine. I'm not going to cry. It's okay. Um, and then when my, one of my professors found out that I didn't go to medical school because that's what everyone was expecting, he said, hey, you want to join us on a field work? It's going to be three weeks. You're going to study uh, bats. And I said, yes, I'm not an outdoor person. I don't do camping. I don't do hikes. Um, but that was the start of it. And those three weeks was the most fun I've had. And I decided to apply for that organization. This organization is called the Philippine Eagle Foundation. And that was my first job out of college. And I saw my first Philippine Eagles and I was hooked ever since. Wow. Oh my goodness. And thank goodness. Uh, well, we're curious, how did you become involved with Hawk Mountain Sanctuary, the world's very first refuge for birds of prey? So while I was at the Philippine Eagle Foundation, we had a science consultant for a short period who was, who was called Dr. Todd Katzner. And Dr. Todd Katzner, I heard, was the first leadership trainee of Hawk Mountain. I didn't get that much chance to interact with him while I was working because I was always on field. But towards the time that I was about to leave because I was planning on doing my master's, uh, we attended a conference together and he started telling me about Hawk Mountain Sanctuary. And he said, hey, this is a good program. I think you should do it. And he said, if you have a chance, because I was headed to Europe for my master's, go to this uh, conference in Scotland as well, which is the Raptor Research Foundation conference. And he said, I'll introduce you to the guy who leads that research. So I went home, I Googled everything. I, it was, the registration was closed, but I still got in and I paid for everything even before I knew I was actually going to school. <laughs> I didn't get my scholarship yet. So the next year I went to Scotland and pretty much I stalked Dr. Keith Bildstein. I was like, Hey, Dr. Bildstein, I heard this about this awesome program. I really want to be a part of it. Um, and he was, he was like, yeah, okay, think about it. So I wasn't sure that I sold myself well enough. So I went, I stalked him to another um, conference in Spain a couple of months after. It was on migration. And I, at that time, I wasn't really that interested in migration. And then I felt like that conversation in Spain was like, okay, I think I'm going to be able to do this. And so in 2011, I came to Hawk Mountain after stalking Keith across two different conferences, and I have not stopped leeching off Hawk Mountain. <laughs> Excellent. Well, yeah. way to persevere, really. <laughs> and we're so thankful. Finally, we're curious. Inquiring minds would like to know, what experiences from your Hawk Mountain traineeship have helped you the most with your current work? Um, I was thinking about this a lot and I came up with two things. The first, and it's not necessarily one is more important than the other. So the first is this emphasis on um, partnership and collaboration and learning that Hawk Mountain has such a broad impact because it helps, it partners with people across the globe. And that emphasis was so refreshing because research and science tend to be very competitive. So it's almost counterintuitive to seek someone out and say, hey, let's work together. But you see that at Hawk Mountain, it works really well. If you have more people working on the same thing, you get better results and you get the results faster. And the second for me personally is empowerment because I wasn't sure how I can continue studying raptors until I came to Hawk Mountain. And then I realized, yeah, I can do this. I can do this because I can partner with people who are better than me. I can learn from them because they're going to teach me. And then hopefully I get to teach someone else. And then there'll be more of us doing this in the Philippines. So it's, yes, there's the science. Yes, there's the training and identifying birds and you know all of those stuff but it's mostly those personal 
in the relationships that made the biggest difference for me when I was at Hawk Mountain. Camille, thank you so much. And we are ready to learn about migration along the East Asian Oceanic Flyway. So take it away, Camille. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Okay, hopefully I don't. I'm gonna stop my video and I'm gonna share my screen. All right, here we go. All right, so thank you again for that introduction, Rachel. And thank you, Hawk Mountain, for giving me this chance to talk about my work, some of the things I'm passionate about. And for everyone who's joining via Zoom, thank you for taking the time. And for anyone who's gonna watch later via YouTube, Thank you again for taking the time to do that. I'm really, really excited to speak about migration along the East Asian Oceanic Byway. And this research in particular is focused on the movement of birds of prey as they approached and departed Philippine islands. Now I chose the title, wind, The Wind in the Water, because it's based off a John Wayne movie and I thought it would be catchy. But it also because it represents two of the environmental parameters that significantly impact this movement. So the title is sort of like a spoiler to what's gonna happen in the talk. Let's see if I can get this started. Okay. So for people who study raptors and observe raptors, we, most of us know that raptors rarely perform long distance flights over the ocean. And this is because for most birds, for most raptors, the ocean is a barrier. Flying over the ocean can be significantly costly and significantly uh, more dangerous than flying over land. And water crossings can be such a huge undertaking that some raptors, if they have to cross 25 kilometers of open water, they just, they just don't do it. One of the more extreme examples is this one. And Javi, if you're watching, I asked for permission, but I used a different photo. So in this picture, you have Javi Alariaga, who was a leadership trainee at Hawk Mountain in 2011. And this was a photograph taken by his friend named Ramon Navarro Blasquez. And here you see him being this true Hawk Mountain rock star. He's stopping traffic because he's trying to protect this immature griffin vulture from being run over by cars. This bird was tired from crossing that, the Strait of Gibraltar. So it was making its flight from um, Africa going into Europe and it got tired with that ocean crossing. Just for some um, context, this is about that crossing at some points is about 14 kilometers of water or 8.6-ish miles. And this is again between southern Spain and northern Morocco where you have the Atlantic Ocean meeting the Mediterranean Sea. And we have a lot of studies coming out of the Mediterranean, for example, that suggest that some birds would tend to go around a longer migration route if they have to cross over certain distances over the water. And so obviously we don't have vultures in the Philippines and the birds I'm going to be talking about are much smaller. They have different flight capacities, but this just shows you the extreme that those birds crossing 14 kilometers of water, they get really exhausted and they land in the middle of traffic. And um, Javi was able to rescue this bird. Sorry, Javi, and thank you. All right. so. Despite that, the ocean can actually be a significant ecological corridor. The ocean can provide straighter and more direct routes to destinations. And these routes can be a refuge from bad weather, from pathogens, and from parasites. However, oceanic crossings are generally poorly understood, so it's difficult to identify why some birds choose to cross the open ocean while others do not. And the reason that oceanic crossings are poorly understood is because among the five migration flyways around the world, only one of them is a major oceanic flyway. So on number, it's number five here with this bird, with a bird picture. And this is what is the general pattern for the East Asian oceanic flyway. And I remember um, 
during one of those lectures at Hawk Mountain, Keith pointing to the Philippines and saying, we don't really know what's going on in there because um, nobody's, nobody studied that yet. So this sparked my interest in migration and the oceanic flyway was pretty much a question mark. We don't really know what is going on in that flyway. And so to contribute to this knowledge gap, I started studying birds traveling along the East Asian Oceanic Flyway. Again, this is the only major oceanic flyway in the world. And it involves a 5,000 kilometer island hopping journey for these birds. The birds that use this route they rely on seasonal monsoon winds, on trade winds, and sea thermals to complete their migration. And so what I've been doing is just characterizing this overwater flight behavior as these birds approach the coastal areas of the Philippines and departed the coastal areas of the Philippines. So just to take you on a little trip, because I don't have a lot of pretty pictures, um, the Philippines is an Asia Pacific archipelago on this figure. It, I made it red just so that it stands out. And the Filipinos, the people of the Philippines share heritage with Pacific Islanders and um, studies would say that we're actually closer to Pacific Islanders than we are to other Asian, Asian people like people from China, Japan, or Korea. If you haven't been to the Philippines, this is an 8,000 mile journey. It's about 25 hours of travel back when we can still travel. And that's also depending on the airline that you use. The Philippines is made up of over 7,000 islands. And these islands, some of these islands completely disappear when it's high tide. And of the 7,000 islands, 2,000 islands are inhabited by people. Now these islands are assigned to three island groups and I just used the primary colors to designate these island groups. We have Luzon in the north, we have Visayas, which is the central group of islands, and then we have Mindanao, where I uh, now live in the south. And it's a tropical place. Anyone who knows me from Hawk Mountain, I always complain about the cold. And that is because the coldest average for the Philippines is 25 degrees Celsius. And that's about 77 in American, 77 Fahrenheit. But it's usually around 32 degrees, which is around 90 Fahrenheit. So it's, I like it pretty warm. So I was born in a town called Cebu, which is on an island called Cebu. Um, I grew up in the north, close to the capital in a place called Antipolo. I spent a lot of my summers growing up um, in a fishing village in, this town, in a place called Batangas. And I now live in Davao City. My hometown is now Davao City. And I forgot to add that little map, but the asterisk that you see here in the bottom is close to where I now work and live. And that is called General Santos. So for any boxing fans, Manny Pacquiao is my neighbor because he is from General Santos. There are over 100 indigenous people groups, and I'll be mentioning one specifically in relation to this research later. I particularly come from an indigenous group in the, one of the northern islands called Alabat Island, and that group is called the Dumagats, which is one of the two truly nomadic tribes in the Philippines. And we have a lot of languages, which over 120 different languages, and I speak one and a half fluently, <laughs> if, you can, if that, you can consider that. And at any given time, well, I don't understand it as well now, but I used to understand like three other um, indigenous languages. And just to demonstrate how different these languages are, if you wanna say good morning, which is, it is morning now in the Philippines, where I grew up in Luzon, in green, you say magandang umaga po. But when you wanna say good morning, where I live now, um, which is Mindanao, um, you would say maayong buntag. In Batanes, where most of the work I'm presenting to you today was, um, is placed, when you say good morning, you say kapyan kapano Diyos, chama bukasaya. So it's a mouthful. I practiced that two weeks to realize that even the elders just say good morning because it's so long. But I'm gonna say it repeatedly throughout the talk because I'm proud that I can say that. All right, 
So moving on to the science. What I've been doing with focusing on seasonal movement of these birds of prey, and I'm specifically interested in the ocean crossing. So they cross as they cross the ocean to arrive some of the Philippine islands and as they cross the ocean when they depart the Philippine islands. And the bird I've focused on a lot is called the gray-faced buzzard. These birds are one of the few raptors that are able to make long distance flights over the water. And they exhibit high fidelity to migration route and stopover sites. So this is based off the work of Japanese researchers where they just are very loyal to the routes that they used to and where they rest in between during their migration. It's also known that the breeding population of gray-faced buzzards are decreasing. They are currently still under the least concern status, but if this continues, they may be elevated into a higher threat level. And some gray-faced buzzards, they spend their winter holidays in the Philippines, but others move on to pursue destinations in Indonesia. And I'm not sure if the video is working, but these are not flies. These is uh, actually a flock of gray-faced buzzards in immigration. So one of the first things I did out of Hawk Mountain is to <clears throat> count migrating hawks at two different points in the Philippines. So one is at a northern entry point to the Philippines, um, which is called Basco, which is this circle on the top of figure eight. And then the second one is a southern exit point from the archipelago in Cape San Agustin. So for the hawks to reach Basco, they would have to, for the hawks to reach Basco, they would have to cross at least 100 kilometers of ocean after leaving Taiwan. And the birds that depart Cape San Agustin cross about 200 kilometers of ocean to reach um, Indonesian islands. So just remember these distances, because I said earlier, for some birds, just that 15 kilometers, 20 kilometers is already a daunting task. So I did this count in two sites, these two sites, and I conducted them from locations with good views on both of these islands, which is what we do also at Hawk Mountain. We have great views at North and South Lookout. In Bosco, it meant occupying a tourist destination called the Naidi Lighthouse. And if you can make out the figure on, at the lighthouse, that is, um, that's not a mannequin, that's actually Patricia Dumandan, who was also a conservation science trainee at Hawk Mountain, I think 2015 or 2016. She is pretty awesome. And in Cape San Agustin, there was almost nothing there when I went there the first time. So we had to build a bamboo tower. I had asked the help of the community. And this was located in the middle of a coconut plantation. So it's a very tropical setting. We were in Bosco for fall of 2014 and in Cape San Agustin, Agustin for fall of 2012. And they used the migration protocols that are learned when I was at Hawk Mountain. So you record um, weather and migration data hourly. And I used these data to start looking at um, some of the details of migration into and out of the Philippines. And I will speak about one of those questions that I answered with this data. And this is looking at any differences that I might see between the species using this flyway in terms of when that migration happens and what are some of the weather parameters that influence this migration, this oceanic crossing. And what I found was that accipiters, and here accipiters are the Chinese spire hawks Accipiter soloensis and the Japanese sparrowhawks, the Accipiter gularius, and I pull them together because it's not always easy to tell them apart. So, <clears throat> based on the information we've got, the data we've gathered, accipiters and gray faced buzzards make up the bulk of migrants using the East Asian Oceanic Flyway. And this is probably due to their flight capabilities and how they can adjust in response to the environment. These two species can switch between flapping and soaring flight. So they can take advantage of any thermals that they encounter, but if they have to, they can use flapping flight with little consequence to their survival. 
I found that for both of these sites in Bosco, which is in the north, and Cape San Agustin, which is in the south, occipiters would pass the watch sites earlier in the season than gray phase buzzards. And this is logical because the migration I'm looking at is a north to south movement. And you'd see that, um, sorry, it's logical that you see birds first in Bosco, then in Cape San Agustin. And so exhibitors, you see, they see them first and they kind of, you see them much longer in the migration season. Whereas gray phase buzzards, you see them around October and this movement is limited to a two week time period. In Basco, birds started flying, um, arriving the coast as early as 5.30 a.m., which is really early. This is just after sunrise. The Philippines has 12 hour daylight all year round mostly. And that migration will actually not peak until much later in the day. So between four to 6 p.m. So this is anywhere between 30 minutes to an hour before sunrise. So you get up really early to see a few birds and then nothing happens. And when you're almost done for the day, that's when the birds start appearing. In Cape San Agustin, the birds were more considerate. Flights usually start at 7 a.m. And this would peak between eight to 10 a.m. And usually we stop seeing birds after around two. And very rarely we do see some birds flying beyond 3 p.m. But the, that one time I saw that happen was after a tropic, tropical typhoon passed. So in terms of when this migration happens, there is differences in the timing between occipiters and gray-faced buzzards. And this is seen in both of the sites. You can see occipiters almost all throughout the season, whereas gray faced buzzards, they only come in October. And in any watch site, it's about a two week time period to observe them. In Basco, however, you have similar within day timing of flights. So the flights would peak either early in the morning or late in the afternoon. And specifically for gray faced buzzards, it is very common to see them search for and land at large roost sites in Bosco. In Cape San Agustin, the occipiters and gray-faced buzzards would pass the site at different times of the day. You'll have the occipiters more commonly passing during early morning and midday, whereas you'll have your gray-faced buzzards most likely passing during midday and early afternoon. So in terms of weather conditions, I build models to try and evaluate what weather conditions are associated with the likelihood of observing larger flocks of birds. And I did this separately for the occipiters, which are displayed as the blue, um, sorry, the boxes, why did I say blue? <laughs> of the occipiters displayed as the empty boxes, and then you have gray faced buzzards as the filled in uh, squares or filled in boxes. And I used weather parameters that are actually just the wind vectors. So you have U wind, where a positive U wind is a wind that is moving from the west going to the east. So that's called an eastward wind. And a V wind, a positive V wind, is moving from the south going to the north. So that's a northward wind. Most of the exhibitors in Bosco are flying in relatively light winds. But the gray phase buzzards, more majority of them are flying in stronger winds, so up to 10 meters per second. And just for, for perspective, the winds in Bosco can be so strong, some of the gusts can be up to 20 meters per second. And when you are on top of Nidy Lighthouse and you are the same size as Patricia Dumandan, you can get knocked over by that wind. So the model suggests that the, the likelihood of observing large flocks of occipiters will increase if you have these tailwinds, which would be more favorable winds because the winds are moving north to south, which is the direction that the birds are moving. But for gray faced buzzards, the model suggests that the likelihood of, of observing more of them increases when you have headwinds. So these are winds moving against the direction that the birds are traveling, which is pretty interesting. And this is for Bosco. And it turns out we see that same pattern for Cape San Agustin. You'll have these exhibitors flying in favorable winds, 
and gray face buzzards, you see more of them when you have these unfavorable winds. So in both of these sites, the gray face buzzards move in headwinds. And this is probably because they were forced to do so. They might have to avoid worse weather conditions because they're flying in October and this, the monsoons have already switched by then. Or um, because they're traveling short enough distances that it's okay for them to go into flapping flights, into headwinds and face that, and that may have relatively little consequence to them. So in terms of comparing migration across these two sites, Although the findings are preliminary because it's just one season for each of these sites, the uh, hypothesis it suggests is that you have similar weather conditions that favor when birds begin flying to cross the ocean and when birds will um, complete that migration. And these observations are actually particularly important because so few overwater crossings have been studied especially outside the European Baltic and the Mediterranean regions. That 2012 count in Cape San Agustin was actually the first full season migration count in the Philippines. And it happened in 2012. And that was made possible through the support of Hawk Mountain. So we are in our infancy in terms of understanding raptor migration and raptor science overall here in the Philippines. And I've started trying to um, kind of tease apart, look more deeper into this flight behavior. And what I'm presenting next is more coarse because I haven't done the full analysis, but I can show you some of the patterns that I've started um, seeing as I start looking at my data. So I went back to Batanes, but this time instead of going to Bosco, I went to a town called Ivana. And Ivana is at the southern end of this island and Vasco would be at the north. And here I'm looking at the potential energetic costs as proxied by the flapping effort of the gray face buzzards. I did this by using the focal sampling method. Essentially, I look for the birds. If I see one, I observe it for 30 seconds and I just start calling out numbers. How many times are they flapping? I can picture Rachel doing her flap, flap, flap glide thing. So we count how many flaps they make within that 30 seconds. And we do these observations between two o'clock to six o'clock in the afternoon in October, because that's when gray face buzzards are passing the sites. And that's when gray face buzzards are looking for the roost sites. And we did this in 2017. Um, here when my son was five weeks old and that was, that's him in the carrier in 2018 when he was a year old and I'm still his world. And in 2019, you can barely see him in the picture because he's already playing with his buddies. Um, he's actually running towards the water. <laughs> I would run towards the water too. So this just happened last year. And again, the assumption is that the flapping flight is a sign of compensation of either the birds are exhausted or they're running into unfavorable conditions. And the people of Batanes, of these groups of islands, they have a special connection with the gray faced buzzards, which is locally known as the Kuya. So the people are the Ivatans. They say, Kapyan Kapanujos Chamavokasaya for good morning. And they rely on, they used to rely on gray faced buzzard as a seasonal source of protein the conditions in these islands are not favorable for large agriculture. And so during October, you have all of these birds, you, you eat them naturally if you don't have any other food source. So the Ivatans are very good at finding these roost sites, at catching the birds and eat, cooking them. But they actually have not done that. Um, they've pretty much abandoned that uh, tradition for I heard about 10 years now and or even 20 years now because they don't see as many gray face buzzards and you don't have as many um, skilled hunters for gray face buzzards anymore. So the first thing we always look at when we're looking at migration is the timing. When do these flights occur? We already know for gray face buzzards, it's in October, two week time period. And if you do just focus on gray face buzzards, just the afternoon flights, this is also the pattern you see. In 
iba na. The gray phase buzzards are seen between October 8th to October 19th. I did try the observation earlier than that and much later and zero gray phase buzzards. The Ivatans know the time, used to know the timing of gray phase buzzards so well that elders will tell you, Camille, you want to look for Kuyab? You want to look for the gray phase buzzard? You look up the sky in the afternoon starting October 11. And that is what we see. About 50% of the flights were observed close to October 11, so between October 9 to October 13. And when I would do, when I would start my observations at October 8, they would start laughing at me like, you're not going to see any birds here. But we do, we see a couple, not a lot, but they are there. And then I wanted to see how that flapping effort, that flight effort relates to the flock size. And I'm running with the hypothesis of safe traveling in numbers, that you have safety in numbers, that if you have larger flocks, that's because the flight is more dangerous. And so just, um, just uh, by doing my, the first level of analysis, just overall looking at the patterns, I put in all of the flock sizes that I had, which is birds flying alone or in pairs up to flocks that are about 230 birds and just looking at the flapping effort. And there aren't, there's not really a lot of obvious patterns that you see here. Um, birds that are flying alone or in pairs, they can be just soaring, but they can also be, most of them are actually um, doing about five to 10 flaps every bout. And this is the same for most other um, flock sizes. Having said that, I don't really have, we don't really see a lot of large flocks of gray face buzzards, and maybe that's part of the reason why we don't have any obvious patterns. And then most importantly, I do want to know how weather influences this overwater flight. And just to remind you, a tailwind is a north wind. It's a wind moving from north to south, and that's a favorable wind, quote unquote. A headwind is a south wind that's wind moving from south to north. And a crosswind can be a wind moving from the east or a wind moving from the west. And so I tried to look at how, what these wind conditions may be related to the sizes of the flocks that these birds travel in. And most of the birds fly in tailwinds. Most of these birds observed approaching the coast of Ivana are in tailwinds more than any other wind. Um, Although we expected you would see here that the smaller flocks would be flying in more favorable winds than the larger flocks, but just without the statistics, it's really hard to tell whether any of these are significantly different because they're overlapping. You also see that birds are completing their ocean. So you see that birds are completing their oceanic crossings under tailwinds with lower flapping rates than the birds flying in any wind direction. But that's only obvious for 2017. <laughs> for the other years, it's not that clear. And each of these years actually had, there were 2019, for example, was an unusual year because in October, you expect a lot of rain, you expect storms. And that didn't happen in October of 2019. We had, it was almost like summer the whole time, which is very unusual for, for that area. Ultimately, more of the flocks are observed in favorable winds and they would have uh, lower flapping rates, which would suggest lower energetic costs. Again, I haven't done the full analysis yet because I've just started looking at the overall patterns that I can see to see what kinds of stories I can tell with this information. So this potentially allows flying in tailwinds with lower flapping rates potentially allows the buzzards to travel further and to travel faster. One of the things I also observed when I was there is that, so our observation post here um, is Ivana, and Bosco would be again at the northern tip of this island called Batan. And in our post, we see this island called Sabtang, which is south. Most of the time we would see the birds flying, um, approaching by the islands, and they would be flying in between these two islands. And we would actually see the birds kind of kettling on above the water, and then some of them would veer towards Sabtang, and then some of them would veer towards um, 
uh, where we are in Ivana. And then sometimes we would see the birds approaching from Samtang. So they were already on Samtang, but then they make this decision, or at least that's how it looks like, that they are going to, um, that they're going to Ivana. So I was expecting to see tired birds, like the bird that Javi tried to save, um, like that uh, griffin vulture. But I didn't see any birds that were aching to land. So just crudely, my prediction when I did that uh, flapping behavior thing was that the gray face buzzard movement occurs in a limited time period. And that's what I found. This is a giveaway because that's, that's the pattern observed for both Bosco and Cape San Agustin. And I didn't expect it to be that much different here. But I also predicted that you have larger flocks that would be more likely spending more energy than those that are traveling in smaller flocks. But just by looking at flapping bouts and flock size, there's no apparent reason. So Camille is wrong in this one. I'm wrong again, because I thought that large proportion of these migrants will be flying in headwinds, because that's what the model suggested for Cape San Agustin and for Bosco. But when you're just looking at the, their behavior as they approach the roost sites, it looks like more of these birds are actually flying in favorable winds. So they're flying in tailwinds and in crosswinds. So these birds are definitely keeping me on my toes. And then my, I predicted that they would be travel, when they're traveling in unfavorable wind conditions, they are more likely to spend more energy. So they're flapping more, but they're also traveling in larger groups. But if I look at the data that way, just by looking at the overall patterns, I actually don't see that either. So Camille is wrong again. So my summary for those last three years is that Camille is wrong. And I'm actually comfortable with that because that means that there's more questions that I can keep asking. So why did my initial model suggest that gray faced buzzards are more likely to be observed, large blocks of them are more likely to be observed in headwinds. And when you look at them more specifically, at that thing more specifically, you don't see that pattern. But what I do know is that this migration behavior is shaped by the wind and by the water. So it is that dependence on wind distribution and where that wind is above the water that allows these gray faced buzzards to do their flights. And this was also the conclusion found by another researcher who actually got to put transmitters on gray faced buzzards. And this is also a little bit worrying for birds who depend on, for migrants who depend on these conditions, because we see this global climate pattern changes. And those may have consequences on migrants like the gray face buzzards and like the exhibitors in the long run. If they depend on those wind patterns, if those patterns change, what will their migration look like? So the patterns observed between the two sites, they do not coincide at all. But this may suggest the plasticity and migration capacity of gray faced buzzards and as well as the exhibitors. It also makes it necessary to continue looking further at these movements. And I, I will promise that I will update Hawk Mountain as soon as I do that analysis, but COVID happened. So now I have to focus on taking care of my son. Um, and again, it was harder for me to do that analysis because all of the things I was expecting to see are wrong. So I'm so glad I looked, but I don't really have a conclusion for you guys yet. So with that, with admitting that I am wrong, I'm going to acknowledge all of the people who steer me on the right direction. So um, these people, um, Petra Wood, Kim, Jim Anderson, and Brendan McNeil were my panel for my PhD. And some of these work I did while I was doing my PhD. I'd like to thank my mentors, um, Todd Kastner and Keith Bilstein, who are the, sh the giants who put me on their shoulders so I can do better. Adam Dewar is really good in math, so I really appreciate him. And Katzner, the members of the Katzner lab were pretty much forced to be my friends while I was in, doing my PhD. My work is re ex largely supported by Hawk Mountain. Um, I received the Project SOAR grant multiple times throughout this um, period. I still receive the SOAR grant grant every once in a while. And I also would like to thank the, the Sperry Fund Scholars in Raptor Conservation Science, which is a scholarship as mentioned by Rachel, that is possible because of the work of Hawk Mountain. 
Um, I also received support from the American Philosophical Society. I received the um, Explorers Fund, and then the Peregrine Fund also supported me, particularly the Burnham Grant. Um, and I'd like to thank the two universities I've been involved with, West Virginia University, where I finished my PhD, and Mindanao State University. Thank you for practicing that, Rachel, by the way. And these are all of some of the amazing people that have helped me make this possible. And this is a big take home message from Hawk Mountain is that you should invest in relationships because they make the, they just make it work. They just make the research work and they have really good insights. And these are um, very, very, I'm very fortunate to, to have these kinds of people be a part of my, my life. And with that, I'll share with you one of my favorite photos from my field work. Um, if you want to get in touch with me, um, cbconceptshawn at gmail.com or just look for me on, um, on Facebook. It's Camille Conceptshawn. Thank you so much for listening. And I'd love to take your questions now. Hi. Sorry, I needed to cough there. <clears throat> All right. Awesome. Thank you so much, Camille. That was great. You're welcome. Let's take a look. Um, we don't have any questions coming up right now. I'll leave a minute if anyone has um, any questions that they'd like to add. All right, we do have one question. Um, the first one is, is there a spring movement that is um, happening through your area? Hi, Bracken. Yes, there is. Um, but I have been mostly focusing on the auto migration. And there is an organization called the Raptor Watch uh, Network. I think I'm saying their name right. And they used to, I'm not sure if they still do it, they do have a spring count somewhere in the Northern Island. But I think it's mostly auto migration because it's, it's more concentrated flight than the spring migrants. I tried with Cape San Agustin. It's very hard to, to find them in spring just because you know they can go any which way, any which direction. So it's easier to do it for, for auto migration. Here's another. It says, do the insurrection movements of Mindanao interfere with your work or that of other scientists? Absolutely. It interferes with everything. <laughs> so you just um, so you just have to be smart about it. You just go to the places where um, logistically it's possible and you just don't go to the places where you you won't feel like you're safe. So a lot of those are happening in Mindanao. Maybe they're not doing it as much now because of COVID, um, but a lot of it is happening in Mindanao. It's largely small tribal groups. It's just their culture. Um, you just, if you just know where to, the places to avoid and the places that you coordinate with so that, you know, so, so that you're safe, because if you're not safe, then you can't really do the research right. Awesome. All right, we have another question that came up. It's, do you coordinate or share information with any other sites in other nations of East Asia? Yes, so we have what is called the Asian Raptor Research Conservation, Research and Conservation Network. We, it is a network that used to meet um, every other year and we do share some of, um, we do share results with each other. So yeah, but we don't have a coordinated count. We don't have anything like Hamana here in this part of the world. Hopefully that's something that will be possible. But yeah, we talk with each other. We just don't have like an organized network like you have in the US. Okay. All right, we have one more question up here. It says, do you plan to do any further work with the Philippine Eagle? Oh, I'd love to. Philippine Eagles have my heart. They got me started on this journey. It's their fault. Um, I, I would love to. I actually, the Philippine, go check out the Philippine Eagle Foundation. They're an awesome group of people. Um, but at the moment, I'm really very fascinated with migration. And I really like studying 
the other there's so many other birds so at the moment migration is the thing that gets me really tickled when i think of the questions um but maybe again sometime philippine eagles don't migrate but they're here i see a lot of them i mean they're i see them in some of my other surveys as well but i don't have anything focused on them at the moment thank you Great. Thank you guys all for sending in those questions. Those are some awesome questions. I'm going to pass it off to Rachel for our closing. Fantastic. I have a question. Uh, Camille, may I have your autograph? And would you recommend this book all about the Philippine Eagle? I recommend anything Philippine Eagle. <laughs> yeah, but autograph will be a little hard. I have to go there, but yes, obviously, yes. Yeah. That's my plan to lure <laughs> you back to Hawk Mountain. All right. Well, uh, thank you so much, Riley, for being just an incredible host for this Zoom, and muchas gracias, Dr. Camille, for an informative and captivating presentation. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, I'll ask you later how to say thank you in your own language and maybe for some language lessons. Well, and thank you to our amazing audience, folks that are joining us from, from home. We certainly appreciate your support. And we actually hope to see you at Hawk Mountain Sanctuary because all of our trails are open. Please visit our website, hawkmountain.org, O-R-G, for social distancing modifications. Well, we have many programs, virtual programs, coming your way soon, including the following. Well, on Wednesday, July 29th at 1 p.m., that's Eastern Standard Time, find out why Kara Karas are cool with Hawk Mountain biologist David Barber. Next, on Friday, July 31st at 11 a.m., learn about the guardians of the Indian grasslands with former Hawk Mountain Sanctuary trainee Devin Mehta. Next, on Wednesday, August 5th at 1 p.m., Learn all about invasive insects and bad biters hmm. with Kyle Shute of the Schuylkill Conservation District. And finally, please join us on Friday, August 7th at 4 p.m. to hone your basic birding skills. Well, thank you so much, friends, and let's keep flying forward. Thank you.